I haven't gotten to use the bell in a long time, but it's nice to hear all that lively conversation of the community. Let us uh, begin our worship this Anzac Day. Te Dakota Tefano, O Auckland Unitarian. Te Dakota Na Manhiri, No Mai Hire Mai, Hire Mai Ki Tene Fare Karakia, Ate, Atu, Te Dakota Te Natato Kato. You might be wondering what the feathers on your order of service have to do with Anzac Day. Good question. All will be made clear in my musings. But for now, all you need to know is that it's called Te Rokura. It is an important symbol to the Maori tribes who affiliate to the Taranaki region. The people of Parihaka witnessed an albatross landing on one of their courtyards, dropping a single feather before departing. For me, it is a symbol of passive resistance to those who use Anzac Day as a patriotic attempt, directly or indirectly, to glorify war. It's also a symbol that honors the passive resistance movement that Toho Kakai and Te Fiti O Rangamai orchestrated in Parahaka as a means of re-elevating the mana of the Maori people. Today's worship is dedicated to all those who peacefully seek justice through nonviolent resistance. We light this, the chalice of our living tradition with these words. To face the world's shadows, a chalice of light. To face the world's coldness, a chalice of warmth. To face the world's terrors, a challenge, chalice of courage. To face the world's turmoil, a chalice of peace. May its glow fill our spirits, our hearts, and our lives. Please join me in the covenant our congregation and your order of service. Love is the doctrine of this church. The quest for truth is the sacrament and service is its prayer. To dwell together in peace, to seek knowledge and freedom, to serve humankind in fellowship, to the end that all souls shall grow in harmony. Thus do we covet it with each other and with our God. Let us stand a fable to sing Spirit of Life. I now invite you to stand to sing our Koha hymn, There is More Love Somewhere. Every couple of years on this day, or this Sunday closest to this day, I play this song by Eric Bogle. Uh, and it's one of the best anti-war songs I know. So I invite you to remember your loved ones and friends who have suffered because of war. suppose we could make that our sermon and just stop now, but I'm a preacher, so I got things to say.
It was a challenge on this Sunday because of our international congregation and live stream. But for them, today marks Anzac Day, held every 25th of April. Anzac, we all know, but they may not, stands for the Australian and New Zealand Army Corps that was formed to fight the Kaiser in World War I. The date was chosen as it marks Anzac's first engagement with the Ottoman Empire at Gallipoli in Turkey in 1915. It was a bloodbath for both sides. 87,000 Ottoman Turks died. 44,000 men from France and the British Empire died. 8,500 Australians died. And 2,779 New Zealanders died. Remember, we only had a population of 1.1 million then. Those men are all buried far from home. In addition, 5,212 5, Kiwis returned it wounded. The Anzacs went off to war certain they would be home by Christmas unaware of how witless and mad Winston Churchill's war plan was. While Turkish forces lost many more lives in the battle, nothing was changed by the blood and gore. The Ottomans retained control of the Gallipoli Peninsula. The whole episode brings to mind U.S. presidential candidate George McGovern's observation, I am fed up to the ears with old men dreaming of wars for young men to die in. Since 1916, both Australia and New Zealand have remembered the scars left on our collective psyches by Gallipoli on Anzac Day. I continue to hope in vain that the ceremonies would not glorify such horrific violence by celebrating how noble were the 7,991 casualties who gave lives and limbs for king and country. I would instead prefer it to be a day of swearing off violence of all kinds now and in the future. While it's traditional to wear the red poppy on this weekend, to my mind, the poppy, for some, has become sentimentalized. The horrific, it sentimentalizes the horrific without requiring the sacrifice of becoming the change we seek. I have decided te rokura, the single white feather or a plume of three, a gift from the albatross left at the sacred site called Parihaka would be more fitting. Te Rokura represents spiritual, physical, and communal harmony and unity. It is an acknowledgement of a higher spiritual power which transcends itself upon earth. It is a symbol of faith, hope, and compassion for all humankind and the environment that we live in. It is not just an anti-war symbol. It is a call to action, in particular, passive resistance to violence in all its many forms. I'm a student of the School of Nonviolence practiced by Mahatma Gandhi, Martin Luther King Jr., and Nelson Mandela. What I did not know before coming to New Zealand was that 15 years before Gandhi's first steps towards passive resistance in South Africa, two Maori leaders, Tefiti Orangamai 
and his brother-in-law, Tohu Kakai, formed a village in the shadow of Mount Taranaki, a visual doppelganger of Japan's Mount Fuji. The village is Parihaka. It was founded on Tefiti's belief in passive resistance in response to the brutal land wars. His ideas eventually influenced Gandhi's successful strategy to overthrow British rule of India. King's successful civil rights movement against segregation and Mandela's dismantling of apartheid. Parihaka's 150 year saga is hard to summarize. The story begins with colonization and European settlers, the Pakehas, demands for land. The crown had a simple cunning plan. It was based on the idea that Mari who fought against the crown for taking their land had therefore, thereby forfeited their property rights, confiscating the land of such rebel natives, fulfilled the dual purpose of punish them, punishing them and making their land available for settlement. In addition, the sale of the confiscated land to Pakeha settlers provided revenue to the crown, essentially paid for the war that allowed Pakeha to claim the land in the first place. When Tefiti and Tohu were forced from their homes, they founded Parihaka on the principle, all fighting must cease. The canoe by which we are to be saved is forbearance. Tefiti's message of peace, nonviolence, and equality drew Mari from far and wide, swelling the population to 2,000. Up to 1,000 more would come for monthly gatherings to hear Tohu and Tefiti speak. It became the largest Mari community in the country. For a decade, the settlement flourished, expanding its cultivations on the surrounding land. For a decade, the people were, weren't opposed. Then in 1878, the slumbering government awoke, prodded into action by settlers clamoring for land. Surveyors began laying out roads and sections, breaking a promise made six years earlier by the Crown. For several months, Tefiti allowed the survey to proceed pending discussion of the situation with the government, but the government showed no inclination to discuss. So in 1879, Tefiti and Tohu began to resist. They had the surveyors and their tools physically removed from their land. When the surveyors returned, they had their pegs uprooted and chopped to pieces. Then Tefiti and Tohu played their trump card. They sent out Parihaka men to plow confiscated settler land. It was a genius move on their part in choosing the settlers' tool to make a political protest against settlement. By using contemporary farming implements and not traditional Maori tools for planting, they asserted their right to participate in the modern economy on land taken in contravention of the government's own word. They would also have been keenly unaware of the, they also would have been keenly aware of the religious symbolism. Mari were constantly being exhorted by missionaries to turn their swords into plowshares, to abandon their savage ways and embrace peace. The Parihaka prophets, practitioners rather than mere preachers of peace, turned the missionaries' words back on them. Peace is what you taught us. Why then did, do you come against us with the sword? Each furrow condemned their hypocrisy. Only men of mana, those of good standing and integrity, 
were sent out to plow. These acts of trespass were not trivial. They required both courage and restraint. As they plowed, the men chanted a song containing the words, I am cast upon a righteous path to be the fuel upon the fire. Tefiti, they claim, will have the final word. The plowmen, if opposed, were not to resist. When asked what should be done in the face of violence, Tohu answered, gather up the earth on which the blood is spilt and bring it to Parihaka. The government got the message and responded swiftly. Plowmen were arrested, fined exorbitant sums they had no hope of paying, deported, and imprisoned. Under the cloak of a national emergency, the government suspended the right to trial and passed the first series of draconian acts that became progressively more desperate and unjust as time went by. Native Minister John Sheehan advised armed constabulary officers not to worry about the legality of their arrests, telling them, you take the men and the government will find the law. Take them, they did. More than 400 plowmen were sent to prisons. Troops were sent to destroy the village and arrest Tefiti and Tohu. If people know anything of the Parihaka story, they know this part. The 2,500 strong community sitting together on Marai through the night of November 4th, 1881, not knowing when the troops would arrive, the 1,500 armed constabulary soldiers and volunteers weighed down with ammunition, encircling the village, expecting violence, but were greeted instead by singing, skipping children and women who had baked 500 loaves of bread to feed their visitors. And yes, a dog which cocked its leg against the cannon and was later believed to have doused the gunpowder with the urine. To this day, if a dog wanders into a meeting, it is not chased out in deference to that defiant animal. We would know very little about this day, the day of plunder, as it's called, were it not for a, day, a pair of journalists who defied a news blackout imposed by the Crown on pain of instant arrest. One wrote, the whole spectacle was saddening in the extreme. It was an industrious, law-abiding, moral, and hospitable community, calmly awaiting the approach of men sent to rob them of everything dear to them. These journalists and papers they worked for were the scant few who dissented from the almost universal vilification of the prophets and what they stood for. One local editor, 11 years later, offered the opinion that all things considered, the Parihaka difficulty might prove to be one of the greatest blessings New Zealand ever experienced. For without doubt, it will be a war of extermination. <coughs> Justice demands these bloodthirsty fanatics should be returned to the dust. The time has come in our minds when New Zealand must strike for freedom, and this means the death blow to the Maori race. While it would be naive to think pockets of such violent racist attitudes don't still exist, thanks to the people of Parihaka being the change Te Fiti and Tohu envisioned, a peaceful path forward has been forged for reconciliation and reparation. Te Fiti and Tohu's way, as voiced by Gandhi, was the active part of, the active part of nonviolence is love. The law of love requires consideration for all life. One who follows this law must not be angry even with the perpetrator of the greatest imaginable wrong. Although he must thus love the wrongdoer, he must never submit to his wrong or his injustice. 
suffer all the hardships to which the wrongdoer may subject him in punishment for his opposition. Parihaka's practice of nonviolence resulted in the Crown officially apologizing on the 9th of June 2017 for the atrocities committed when it sacked the peaceful Taranaki settlement of Parihaka in 1881. People openly wept as the apology was read out by treaty negotiator the Treaty Negotiations Minister Chris Finlayson. He apologized for the wrongful arrests and imprisonment of Parihaka men and their leaders, Te Fidi O Rangamai and Tohu Ka Kahi. Mr. Finlayson also apologized for the rape and molestation of the women and girls who were left behind when the men were imprisoned in the South Island. He said it was a shameful part of New Zealand's history, which both Maori and Pakeha found hard talking about for different reasons. May the story of Parihaka become one with who we are. Let us hold up the white feather with love and determined resolve. So be it. During the first Iraq war, I was a minister of a little Episcopal church out in the desert. And every Sunday, we ended the service singing something by Mozart called Dona Nobis Pacha. You may know the words, but I've invited Yo-Yo Ma to come and play the tune for you. <laughs> so he's going to play the tune, and then we're going to sing it, first in unison, then the women get their moment, the men get theirs, and then we end by singing in unison one more time. So let's see if I can pull this off. Oh, let's Join me in the words for extinguishing the chalice. We extinguish this flame, but not the light of truth, or the community, or the fire of commitment. These we carry in our hearts until we are together. I have kind of an unusual closing words for today. Um, it's a song, Perihaka, by herbs. I want to say herbs. You all say herbs. Uh, with Tim Finn. Uh, it tells the story beautifully. I now invite you to listen to John Lennon, imagine, and then afterwards, I know it's later than usual, but I hope you'll stay and join in small groups to discuss the conversation start.